Hello, everyone, and welcome to MOS Live. Uh, today, we are looking at these live animals all about sticky feet. It is also part of our National Chemistry Week that we are putting on this week. My name is Sarah, my pronouns are she and her, and I'll be keeping an eye out for all of your questions today. Thank you for those of us who are tuning in on Facebook or YouTube, but please know that we're not able to take your comments and questions uh, from those platforms. But if you are here on Zoom, you can press the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and ask any questions that you may have. If you'd like a shout out, don't forget to leave your name and age. If you'd like to see captions, you can click on the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen and select show captions. So now I would like to invite my first museum educator and our animal friend to introduce themselves and let's get started. Hello everyone, my name is Corey and I am the invert keeper here at the Museum of Science. And with me today is Liz, our uh, assistant curator in our live animal center. So today we have some animals that have some sticky feet. So before we get started, a quick disclaimer, most of the animals that you're gonna see today the main reason they're able to climb so well is physics, but there is a little bit of chemistry involved and we're gonna talk about that as well. So the first animal we're gonna talk about is our dragon headed katydid. So these guys, you might take a look and say like, oh, that looks like a grasshopper. And you would be correct. They are related to grasshoppers, but they are different. So katydids are closely related to grasshoppers, but they are different. So this uh, dragon headed katydid is an amazing climber. You can see right here that she is stuck up onto the glass and she is using her tarsi, which are her feet to hang onto the glass. So insects have different legs than we do. They first of all have six of those legs, but their shape is a little bit different. So at the end of their legs, what we would call toes are their tarsies. So that can pot, that is a combination of pads on the bottom of their feet, along with these two, they almost look like claws at the end. So the claws help them grab onto things, but the pads are what make that magical stickiness. So their pads don't have glue or anything like that on them. They actually have hundreds and hundreds of little tiny tubular hairs that when a glandular um, substance is released from the insect's foot, it is then, it helps those hairs stick to the side of the glass. So dragon-headed katydids are uh, from Southeast Asia. These guys are omnivores. So they eat plant material and they also eat meat. So these guys are big insects, insect eaters. Here at the museum, they get a variety of uh, fruits and vegetables, and then they eat mealworms. If you've been on our programs before, you've probably heard that a lot of our animals here also eat crickets. Our katydids, they can't eat crickets because they're too closely related. And any disease that a cricket would have could then make its way into our dragon-headed katydids. So when feeding these guys, I actually have to disinfect our tongs or any feeding device before feeding them so we don't transmit that disease. Um, these guys are super cool. We have our female here with us right now. And you can kind of tell when uh, Liz takes her out in a little bit, you'll be able to see really well. She has a long ovipositor at the end of her body. And that's what she uses to lay her eggs. The males are a little bit smaller and they do not have an ovipositor. So I'm actually going to turn it over and see if we have any questions about insects and their feet and how they can climb walls and glass or about Katie did's in general. Oh yes, we already have plenty of questions. Um, so we'll start with this first question from Vivian, age nine, and from Brady. They wanna know how long do they live and if this animal has a name? That is such a great question. So we actually really don't know. So scientists and keepers who, uh, like myself, who uh, have these animals and raise them is, we really don't know. It's anywhere from one year to three years has been the observation. Um, and that includes their egg stage and nymph stage into adulthood as well. 
So ours here at the museum tend to live for about a year and a half, um, but we also don't breed these guys here. We actually get these guys from another institution that has their breeding down really well because their breeding is very complicated. This female does not have a name, um, although she's the only female in her enclosure, so we could definitely give her one because she is very different from our other Katie Dids. We did have a Katie Did whose name was Blue. Um, he was, he's up in our butterfly garden right now. And you might have seen a video about him before because he has a broken jaw. And so we actually had to pull him out and hand feed him all the time. So he had a special name because we had to work with him so much. Great. So we know that you mentioned a cricket as a relative. Vivian age nine wants to know, are any of these guys relatives also have sticky feet? That's such a wonderful question. So the answer is yes. Um, and it, it's, it's such a wonderful question because it also depends on the insect. When we think like insects can crawl and walk on all these different surfaces, that's not necessarily true. Each insect in a, each species has an individual way that they can walk. So for instance, um, crickets, they don't have, their feet aren't as good as cl at climbing like glass walls as our Katie did is. Um, they don't have that same secretion and those same uh, toe pads as our Katie did. But a grasshopper, some species of grasshoppers do and they are able to climb. Or if you've ever seen a fly who is just hangs on the side of your wall or on the side of your window, those guys do have sticky pads um, that they use to be able to climb. Um, but also we have our stick insects. And stick insects, again, it depends on the species, are the giant stick insects are really good at climbing almost all surfaces, while our Australian prickly sticks, they're really bad at climbing um, any smooth surfaces. They really need a tree or leaves to hang on to. Um, they don't have that same toe, that same padding on their feet as some other insects. That's a great question. All right, let's see. So many amazing questions coming in. Um, let's see. We have some questions. Sylvie age 10 asks, does she bite? And Anigan age 10 asks, is it dangerous? And someone else asked, uh, Nell asked, why does Liz have to wear gloves? Those are wonderful questions. So we tend to say here at the museum that anything that has a mouth can bite. So dragon headed Katie is being omnivores. They do actually have these pretty sharp mandibles that they use to grab on and kind of move food into their mouth. Um, would they bite, would this Katie did bite Liz? Probably not, could it? Definitely. So just to be safe, Liz is gonna be wearing the glove. Um, but really they're pretty harmless. Um, these guys don't have large spikes on their, on their legs like some of our other animals do. Um, they're pretty friendly animals, but again, we just would rather be safe than sorry with these guys. All right, we have some amazing observations coming in as well. Oh, wonderful. Um, so Emily says, who are their predators? It looks like they can potentially defend themselves by blending into leaves. And Noah says, do they camouflage? And then Vivian also asked about camouflages and said a great name would be Leaf. I'm assuming because maybe it looks like a leaf. That would be a great name. Leaf would be a wonderful name. So yes, these guys do camouflage in really well with their environment. They do kind of look like a leaf, especially their wings. Um, Liz, if you want to turn her sideways, maybe we can get a view of those nice speckled wings. Oh, yes. Um, so yes, I think there was a lot in that question. The camouflage, definitely they like to camouflage because again, they can bite, but that's not really a great defense for them. Um, predators, pretty much anything that's carnivorous, birds are gonna be a big one. As you can also see, her body is huge. So she makes a really good snack for any animal that can get her hands on her, but birds are gonna be a big one. These guys also use, they have that shield that protects the most um, vulnerable part of their body. So their, um, what connects their head to their thorax is kind of this, like you can almost see it on her. She, you can see that neon green. Um, that part is gonna be the most flexible and the most easy for predators to get to. So that's why she has that big shield covering her. And right below that are where the Katie Dids will rub, um, they'll move their wings to create a chirping sound. So these guys are pretty funny because they're nocturnal. They sleep during the day and they're awake at night, but I'm not here at night and to feed them. So I have to wake them up 
in the afternoon right before I leave for the day so they can get their dinner. And let me tell you, when I wake them up, they give me a nice little chirp to say, oh my goodness, what are you doing in here? Um, which is pretty funny to see their little, their little startling chirp. So we have to wake them, I have to wake them up gently so as not to startle them so much. Great, so Julie has an observation. Why is she twirling her antennae so much? That's such a wonderful question. So Katie did's antennas are really sensitive. So we actually try really hard to not touch their antenna at all. So when I'm offering food, I make sure that it's going under her mandible, so her mouth, uh, where her senses are instead of her antenna because they are so sensitive. So she uses those to smell her environment. As you can tell, she is making a run up Liz's arm right now. Um, and she's using those antenna to smell because she's actually never been in this room before. Um, and we don't handle them that often. So they really just come out for very special programs. Um, so again, this is all new to her. So she's using those antenna to smell everything because it's all new to her. Awesome. All right. Well, we have a lot of more, a lot more questions, but we have two other animals to get to. So I am going to put up some more information about uh, the animal. So feel free to take a picture of this or a screenshot uh, so you can learn a little bit more about it. And then our educators will let us know when we're ready with our next animal. All right, I think we are ready whenever you guys are for the next sticky feet animal. Corey's gonna pull it up in just a second. So you guys may have thought maybe we would have one of these animals in our sticky feet edition. So it is a frog, more specifically, this is called a white's tree frog. Now we don't have this kind of frog here in the New England area, but we actually do have another kind of tree frog called a gray tree frog. Now, as you can imagine, gray tree frogs are mostly gray in color. Now, white tree frogs in the wild are native to Australia. Now, you probably noticed they're not white in appearance. They actually are named after the scientist who first described them. Other common names for this kind of frog are Australian tree frog, um, green tree frog, also dumpy tree frog. They do tend to get pretty chubby, uh, so that's why they are often called dumpy tree frogs. Now their habitat in the wild is mostly trees. Um, like our other animals with sticky feet, they do tend to spend a lot of time up in trees. Right now he's kind of sitting on the ground, but we may get to see him climb uh, the side of his glass at some point. Um, but they certainly would be mostly on tree leaves and tree bark in the wild. They actually do prefer kind of tropical rainforests are their favorite kind of habitat. And you can see their coloration, kind of like our Katie did, does help them with camouflage uh, in those environments. Um, they actually are kind of even brownish a little bit and green. So their camouflage helps them both with tree bark uh, and with leaves. Now, White's tree frogs are predators. They are carnivores. Ooh, we'll get to see some climbing now. Um, so they are pretty good predators. They tend to eat a lot of insects that might otherwise be pests. Things like moths, locusts, beetles, even cockroaches are, are pretty common for these kinds of frogs to eat. Now we need to talk about the most important feature of the White's tree frog, and that is their feet. So it's actually pretty appropriate that right now you're getting an awesome glimpse at his feet. Now this is where we get the stickiness, uh, the theme of our show and kind of the idea that these frogs are sticky. Look at those toe pads. So that's actually what is allowing the frog to stick. Now these toe pads are really large. Look at the size of them and the relation to the frog's foot. They're pretty big. Now they do have uh, rubbery cells on those toe pads that allow them to stick. Now the most important thing about tree frogs that allows them to stick is the fact that they are covered in mucus. Now, a lot of times people get pretty grossed out by that. A lot of people don't even like the word mucus. Uh, you think of sneezing, you think of snot, uh, runny noses, um, but mucus is really important for amphibians. So amphibians 
can potentially dry out or desiccate if they're not moist enough. So most frogs do look pretty slimy in appearance, and that is because they are covered in mucus. Maybe you didn't think of it as the same stuff that's up in your nose, um, but amphibians are covered in that mucus. Now again, it is really important that they keep themselves from drying out. Amphibians do both water and gas exchange through their skin. So it's kind of like they breathe through their skin. If they don't have that mucus covering, they actually can't do that gas exchange and they wouldn't be able to breathe well. So mucus in general is very important to amphibians, but it really enables our white's tree frog to climb and to hang onto surfaces. And they are pretty good at it. I know you saw him slip a little bit. Uh, they tend to be really good at different surfaces, leaves, tree bark. Sometimes they'll even wander into people's homes and people will find them in toilet bowls and sinks. They do tend to do better on surfaces that are more wet. Uh, so you will notice I really wet down uh, the paper towel he's sitting on right now. They do better with those wet surfaces. If something is completely dry, it is hard for them to get that mucus to interact with the surface uh, in order to stick properly. Now I'm sure this already brought up lots of questions. So why don't I turn it over to some of those? Yes, absolutely. All right, let's start with this question. Uh, Vivian, age nine, and Sylvie, age 10, ask the same exact question. Uh, what is the gender, name, age, and lifespan of this oh, animal? Oh, goodness. Hopefully, I can remember all of that. Um, <laughs> Pretty sure this one is a male. Um, females tend to have a more white throat. Um, those are kind of general things you can look for. We don't know for sure. Um, we have heard this one actually lives with a cage mate. Um, we have heard at least one of them doing some of the male calls. So males have kind of louder calls. Oftentimes with frogs, they use it uh, to kind of attract the females. So my best guess is that this one is a male, but I actually don't know 100% for sure. Um, this white's tree frog is about eight years old, um, which often surprises people. That seems like a pretty long lifespan for a frog. They're well known to live into their teens. I've even heard of one in captivity living to be 20 years old. So hopefully this one has an equally long life ahead of it. Um, this particular white tree frog we do call Bluto. Um, so he does have a name. Uh, did I hit all of those questions? Was there a part I forgot? Nope, you hit them all. Great. All right, awesome. Um, so let's see, Dean age nine wants to know if this frog is full grown. You will see certain individuals of White's tree frogs a lot larger than this one. I actually used to have one as a pet years ago who uh, I affectionately sometimes referred to as a frogzilla because it was almost three times the size of this one. So I think for this individual, this is probably about his full size. Um, but just like with humans, we come in a lot of different sizes. You could see one more like about four inches in length, um, if that's a helpful comparison to think of. Um, but I don't think this one is going to get much bigger. Great, so we have some questions about the mucus. So Vivian H9 wants to know what is the mucus? And Noah wants to know uh, if this frog does not have as much mu mucus, will it be a real big difference? So that mucus, again, is extremely important to them. Um, they would potentially dry out and die if they weren't covered in that mucus. Um, they actually have a cool adaptation. They can secrete an extra layer of that mucus to kind of protect their bodies if it is going to be a dry part of the year and maybe they won't have as much access to water. So that is something kind of cool that they can do. Um, now the mucus, it is kind of that same material that makes up your snot. Uh, when you sneeze into a tissue, it's that same material. It's the same thing. Um, so we have it in our bodies too. Uh, it is kind of funny to think of frogs as having that mucus, um, but they certainly do and their entire bodies are covered in it rather than hopefully just like our nasal passages. All right, we have, I noticed that Corey was wearing gloves when she touched the frog. Why did she do that? Yeah, so it's actually for a different reason than we were having gloves for our Katie did. Um, the gloves are more to protect the frog. 
So remember I talked about that gas and water exchange that frogs can do through their skin? That would mean that anything that's on Corey's hand could potentially pass into the frog. So it's more our way of protecting the frog in case we have something on our skin uh, that we don't want uh, to be touching or get into them. All right, so I think this will be our last question for this animal. Um, we have some questions about their eyes. Um, do they have anything wrong with their eyes, but also can they push their eyeballs down? I think I know where someone is going with that second part of the question. Um, this individual doesn't have anything wrong with his eyes, but frogs do use their eyes to help them eat. I know that sounds crazy, but when they put an insect in their mouth, they can actually push those eyes down and kind of push the animal back towards their throat. Because if you imagine you're a cricket, you probably don't want a frog to eat you. So you might try to still get away even after you're already in the frog's mouth. So that's really great that someone knew that. They can use their eyes to push that animal back into their throat. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna put up some information about this animal while we get ready with our next one. Uh, so feel free to take a picture of this screenshot, whatever you would like to learn more about our white tree frog. And then we'll let us know when we're ready with the next animal. We are ready whenever you are. Perfect, all right. All right, so our final sticky animal is called a toke gecko. Sure, most of you have heard of geckos before. Now, geckos are actually a type of lizard, so they are reptiles, a little bit different than our white's tree frog, which was an amphibian. Now, there are over a thousand different species of geckos, so it's a pretty big group within the lizards. Now, toke geckos are actually the second largest kind of gecko. Uh, full size, they can get about a foot in length. This one that you're looking at might not quite be at that foot or 12 inches, but I think he's still pretty respectable in size. Now, toke geckos in the wild do live in parts of Asia places like India, uh, Malaysia, that's kind of where you're going to find them. Now they do tend to live in trees, also alongside cliffs. Those are going to be their preferred habitats. Now toke geckos, like our tree frog, are pretty good predators, pretty good carnivores. And they also eat a lot of things that tend to bother people. They will eat similar things to the frog, beetles, locusts, cockroaches. They're even known to eat small vertebrates. So tiny mice, uh, tiny things like that, they are willing to go after. Now they are pretty feisty and pretty vicious animals. I know he's pretty adorable in appearance, but they are known for being pretty aggressive. So that's one of the reasons Corey's not going to be taking him out of the case. Uh, actually my former senior curator, here at the museum. He worked here for over 20 plus years. He's worked with animals for over 40 years. The worst injury he ever had was from a toke gecko. Uh, so they do have very strong jaws. They are pretty feisty animals. Now we need to talk about kind of the star feature on our gecko and that would be the stickiness. So we're gonna focus on their feet now. Now their feet are actually going to be more similar to the katydid that you learned about first than our white's tree frog that you learned about second. Now you're getting a pretty good close up view at one of the uh, feet of the toke gecko right now. So what you are able to see with your bare eye, what you're looking at right now are folds on those gecko's toes. Now what you cannot see are tiny microscopic hairs within those folds. Now these hairs are called setae, so they have that special word. Now if you got even closer, had an even stronger microscope, and you went to look into those setae, you'd actually find even smaller hairs that are called spatulae. So even though it might look like you just see a couple folds on this gecko's toes, their toes are actually covered in thousands and thousands of those microscopic hairs. Now the hairs themselves are not sticky, so it wouldn't feel sticky to the touch, 
But because there's so many of them, those hairs are able to interact and get really, really close to the molecules on a surface, like our glass container that he's in right now. So these molecules get so close that they actually can interact with something called a van der Waals force. Now this is extremely strong. A gecko's toes can support the weight of two humans. Uh, of course he stumbled when I said that, um, but it is a very strong interaction. And they actually, since it is so strong, they can't break it just by lifting their foot. They have to curl their toes back to break that connection um, because it is so strong. So it is pretty fascinating that this gecko just uses thousands of hairs in order to adhere to surfaces. Um, so it is pretty cool. Uh, now sure this opened up a lot of questions about our gecko. Yep, so let's start uh, with the same question from Vivian age nine. What is the name, gender, age, and lifespan? Um, this one is most likely a male, kind of like our white tree frog. It's not the easiest to tell. Males tend to be more brightly colored um, and a little bit larger. So compared to pictures I've seen of females, I'm pretty confident that this one is a male. His name is Nepal. Um, that's one of the areas where you will find them in the wild. So we thought that was a good name for him. And he is actually 15 years old. I had to double check his records because that's actually getting pretty old for a Toke gecko. Uh, pretty common lifespan for them is about 10 years. Um, so let's not tell him that because uh, he is still pretty healthy and doing pretty well. Great. Okay, let's see. Lexi, age 11, wants to know, what is the lump of skin on his throat? Um, I, I don't know if you're thinking, he has two kind of almost like sacks of skin to the side, the ones that Corey just pointed out. I'm guessing that's probably what uh, people were noticing. Um, those are actually fat storage. Um, so those are actually deposits where they can keep fat. Um, here at the museum, he gets fed pretty well. Um, so he doesn't really need to store, on, store nutrients or hang on to things like that. Um, but in the wild, it might be harder to find food at different times. So they can actually store store it and kind of save those nutrients for later. Um, if someone did notice the throat, you're probably just noticing the toke gecko take some breaths in and out. So they have lungs inside their bodies just like we do. Um, and that's where you're going to see them take those breaths. Uh, really good close up image of that right now. Awesome. So Sophie, age 11, made a great observation, um, says that the gecko seems to have five toes, four fingers, which looks like the same as the white's tree frog. Is that a coincidence? So, wow, you guys are really good at uh, counting uh, digits on these animals. Um, this toke gecko is actually missing uh, two front toes. Um, so he should have an extra on each front foot. Yeah, Corey's gonna point it out right there. Um, it's hard to be 15 years old as a toke gecko. Um, so sometimes they do, you know, sustain injuries, um, but that was a really close observation. I actually said to Corey ahead of the program that uh, I wasn't sure if someone would notice uh, during the show, but you guys are too smart. Oh, I just muted myself. Okay, let's see. Cody, age nine, wants to know, can it change color? They do not change color. I know a lot of times people think they kind of look almost like chameleons. Maybe it would be really cool if they changed color. Um, sometimes they'll dull in color as they grow and as they age. Um, they might be a little more brightly colored when they first hatch, um, but they can't really change uh, color like a chameleon. Hero, age 10, wants to know, does it have a long tongue? They do have a pretty long tongue. Um, they do use their tongue to help them smell. Um, similar to snakes, they have something called a Jacobson's organ, so they can stick their tongue out. It's not like a chameleon tongue. It's not going to reach an insect that's, you know, across the enclosure that he's in. But it is, you know, probably, I would say, about an inch long, uh, and he will mostly use it to help him smell. Also, geckos often use their tongues to lick their eyeballs to keep them clean. I know that sounds gross, um, but a lot of them don't have eyelids, so they actually will use those tongues to keep those eyes clean. Well, that's great. You just answered the next question of do their oh. eyes have a covering? They do um, not. Right. Let's see, one last question. We're running a little late, but um, 
people want to know a little bit more about how they stick. So is the force of the stick similar to what a magnet might feel like? It's not quite the same as a magnet. Again, it's just a molecular interaction. Um, so I don't know how else best to explain it. It's just those thousands of thousands of hairs. They're so, so tiny that they can just get really, really close to any imperfections that are in the glass. We think of glass as being really, really smooth, but there's lots of little divots and imperfections. Um, so it is just kind of an attractive force, those van der Waals forces between them. Um, that's the best I can explain it because I'm not a physicist by nature, um, but I'm sure you could look up a much better one. All right, well, thank you so much. We are a little over time, but I will put up some more information about this animal so that hopefully that will answer some of the questions that were there. So thank you so much. All right, you're welcome, bye guys. All right, so again, feel free to take a picture, screenshot of this. Hopefully this answers some of the questions about the gecko. Um, we had so many unanswered questions today, so I'm so sorry that we didn't get to them all. Um, but thank you. Thank you for being amazing scientists and observing everything that you did. Um, so again, this was part of our National Chemistry Week. Uh, and so tomorrow at one o'clock, we have our big science show, which will be the end of National Chemistry Week. So I hope that you guys can all go and watch that. Um, if you'd like to see more of our virtual offerings, you can go to mos.org slash mos at home. And if you would like to support the museum, if you enjoyed today's program and all of our programs, you can visit engage.mos.org slash welcome. So thank you so much. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow at 1 p.m. as well and have a great rest of your day.